Um, so this is, uh, this is joint work with uh, Michael Goldman from, uh, uh, from Paris, uh, uh, which uh, is, as one says, in favorable review by the analysts of the UNS. And, uh, and uh, also I will report on ongoing work with uh, Michael and Martin Hussmann, uh, which, is, uh, which is on the archive and which is related to, uh, uh, to the application and, uh, uh, to the matching problem. Okay. So, uh, uh, so the first part will be uh, uh, kind of uh, um, reviewing or kind of working out a, a different approach uh, uh, to the famous approach by Caffarelli uh, uh, to the regularity for the Mange-Ampère equation uh, right away using the fact that the Mange-Ampère equation can be uh, to some extent be interpreted as the Euler-Lagrange equation of optimal transportation so in a certain sense it's, uh, it's uh, if you're interested in regularity of the uh, Brunier map it's a shortcut towards uh, at least partial regularity or epsilon regularity of the uh, of the uh, of optimal transportation, and the second, uh, uh, if I have the time, the second uh, the second uh, uh, part of the talk will be uh, will be related to uh, an application of this type of regularity theory or an extension of this type of regularity theory uh, to uh, what is called the matching problem, uh, which I will explain that. So that's the uh, that's the plan for uh, for what I want to do. So. Uh, so here is just uh, a brief reminder, which probably uh, uh, this audience doesn't really need, uh, uh, of an optimal transportation problem, where here uh, we focus on the, on the simplest possible setting, where uh, uh, we're looking at the optimal transport between two sets in RD. And optimal transport now with the usual uh, Euclidean, uh, square Euclidean distance function. So we're given two sets, uh, omega and lambda in RD. <laughs> which have equal the bag measure and uh, uh, we're looking at all maps uh, T uh, that push forward the Lebesgue measure concentrated on omega into the Lebesgue measure concentrated on lambda and we minimize the, uh, uh, the cost of uh, shipping uh, the mass which is described by the characteristic function of omega into the mass which is described by the characteristic function of, uh, uh, of lambda. So that's the uh, uh, well-known optimal transportation problem. And then, uh, 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 as it's uh, kind of uh, fairly easy to see, uh, the, uh, uh, the minimizer uh, must be the gradient of a convex function. So uh, uh, that's the uh, Brunier map. Uh, and formally speaking, at least if it were regular, uh, we would get from, uh, uh, from, this, prop uh, from this property here that it's uh, 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 that it's uh, that the map has um, a Jacobian, the determinant of which is equal to one, which gives <laughs> rise to, uh, at least in the formal sense, the Mangin-Pair equation. And uh, uh, and so uh, uh, Caffarelli's famous theory uh, was first um, dealing just with the Mangin-Pair equation, but then there was that was kind of uh, the paper around ninety. And then there was a second paper on 92, I guess, where he uh, 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 argued that this theory can also be applied to this type of uh, uh, optimal transportation problem. And the outcome of this theory is kind of a global uh, regularity result that uh, this map is smooth provided the target domain is convex. And then uh, uh, I think it's folklore, or uh, many of you will know that in general, uh, T does not need to be smooth if the target domain is non-convex. Of course, that's obvious if the target domain is not connected, uh, but then you can convince yourself by some continuity argument that even uh, a, a thin thread which connects the two parts doesn't change the transportation map too much so that it must uh, retain its, uh, its discontinuity. Okay, so, uh, so therefore, uh, therefore, even for this very simple situation, if uh, uh, kind of the target domain is not convex, uh, regularity is by itself an interesting, an interesting question. So, uh, so here is the, uh, uh, the main result, which uh, uh, gives a partial, uh, a corollary of which gives partial regularity in the situation which I just described. Partial regularity means that uh, 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 you, get, uh, uh, you get an open set of full measure on which the optimal uh, map is regular. 
and it uh, it comes from something which in usual regularity elliptic or parabolic regularity theory is called an epsilon regularity result so here I'm stating this epsilon regularity result uh, which by the way uh, now we give a completely different proof which I'm going to tell you about which uh, as it stated is not a new result uh, uh, that's something which was proved by uh, by Alessio Figali and Kim in uh, well a couple, almost 10 years ago and then refined quite a bit by De Filippis and Figali uh, they're based on uh, kind of the Caffarelli approach so what's uh, what's the uh, uh, what's the uh, epsilon regularity theorem stating so uh, it's um, this, uh, I th probably the first time this notion of epsilon regularity came up in the theory of minimal surfaces. And, and the theory of minimal surfaces by, you know, where again De Giorgi was uh, probably the main motor behind it. Uh, uh, the, the theory of minimal th surfaces states if you already know that in a certain sense uh, around one point the minimal surface is sufficiently flat, then it must be regular. So kind of a mild type of being close to a plane uh, enforces uh, being close to a plane in a very strong sense, being smooth. So that's a typical epsilon regularity result. And in optimal transportation, you have the same, uh, uh, the same phenomenon. So for any Hölder exponent alpha, there exists a threshold. If you want a universal number, small number, which is in principle ex can be made, you know, which is constructive. Uh, which just depends on the dimension d and on this Hölder exponent alpha, so that whenever uh, you have a uh, you have a ball which is contained in both the initial and the target domain, that's not by an affine change of variables. That's not a big uh, restriction, and you know that in this ball, uh, your transportation energy is below the threshold and you rescale the transportation energy in the right way to make it non-dimensional so that means you're uh, looking at a volume uh, integral here then you take the square root and then you divide by length that's the rescaling which makes this quantity non-dimensional and only on a non-dimensional quantity it makes sense to require smallness because otherwise it would be in a certain sense an empty statement so if this non-dimensional local transportation cost is small then in, uh, in the ball of half the radius uh, you get what you want, namely you get uh, 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 C2 alpha for uh, the transportation potential or C1 alpha for uh, the transportation map, which is exactly the type of regularity which you would expect. So that's, uh, uh, that's uh, an epsilon regularity statement for optimal transportation. And uh, again, that's, uh, uh, as it's stated, not a new result. Uh, but we give uh, kind of uh, a new proof of it and then we extend the theory in a way which I will explain in a second uh, but uh, now I want to uh, I want to tell you our variational approach behind this epsilon regularity result so that's what I what I want to do now so uh, and uh, and in fact this uh, so so the kind of the main difference between the Caffarelli approach uh, which then was used also by, um, by, by Figali and co-workers. And what we're doing is that uh, um, we use the variational structure and we only use the variational structure. So in a certain sense, the Mange-Ampère equation is a very peculiar uh, equation because it's at the intersection between what's called a fully nonlinear, a non-divergence form equation on the one hand side and on the other hand, it also belongs, as we all know, to it's the Euler-Lagrange equation of a variational problem. And, uh, and the Caffarelli theory is based on kind of the first world, that it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a fully nonlinear uh, uh, elliptic, degenerate elliptic equation, and you have, but still you have the maximum principle at your disposal, and all the regularity theory is based on smart comparison with upper and lower solutions, the so-called Alexandrov lower and upper estimates. I guess some of you have perhaps uh, looked at that. And, um, and now, now the, 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 the path we take is completely orthogonal to this. I mean, we never use maximum principle. We just use the variational structure uh, very much, again, in the spirit of the theory uh, for minimal surfaces. And the way, uh, the convenient way to use the uh, uh, the variational structure 
is to appeal to the Eulerian formulation of optimal transportation. And uh, that will hopefully become apparent in a second why it's, uh, it's, uh, you have more flexibility to use the Eulerian formulation. Um, but uh, it shouldn't come as a surprise because the Eulerian or uh, Benamou Brunier uh, formulation of optimum transportation makes it very explicit that you're actually dealing with a convex variation problem. And after all, for convex variation problems, things should in principle be good, right? Because one's replacing the seemingly non-convex variation problem by a convex variation problem. So uh, 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 perhaps that's something I can write on the blackboard if I see the chalk. Uh, it's here. Um, so uh, so the, uh, the, the Eulerian formulation is you introduce an artificial time variable next to your uh, uh, space variable. And it's an artificial time variable because the time direction doesn't really matter. And uh, uh, you should think of your initial measure uh, 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 being uh, 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 kind of attached to the t equals zero slice. So that's the characteristic function of omega. Here you have the characteristic function of lambda. And then uh, you're looking uh, at uh, all solutions of the continuity equation. So you're looking at the density, or in general a measure, a non-negative measure, uh, uh, and a flux, so uh, a vector valued measure uh, that satisfy the continuity equation in the distributional sense. And so that uh, at uh, time t equal to, uh, to 1, at time t equal to 0, uh, you have these initial and boundary data. So that's, that, in a certain sense, defines your admissible set uh, of pairs rho j. And then you're minimizing uh, the space-time integral of uh, this, uh, uh, this expression here, here. And if I've learned one thing from Jan, then that this expression here is a convex expression jointly in rho and j, which is very important, uh, uh, which, is a, which is a very important observation. Okay, so that's the uh, uh, that's the um, that's the uh, uh, that's the Eulerian uh, formulation of optimal transportation. So instead of uh, looking in a certain sense of this picture, we look uh, uh, we're we're thinking of that picture. So that's just an honest uh, reformulation of the problem. And now the 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 main ingredient for for our approach to the epsilon regularity uh, theory is the following. Uh, um, approximation by harmonic functions argument. So again, that has a lot of similarity with the uh, theory of minimal surfaces, where those who know it uh, know that the main step or the core step um, in, proving that, uh, in proving this epsilon regularity uh, result is to show that you can approximate uh, in energy um, a minimal surface pretty well by the graph of a harmonic function. And, uh, and you do that because you, this way you can borrow the regularity theory of harmonic functions, which we all understand and learn uh, very early, uh, uh, in order to infer regularity theory for minimal surfaces. Now the same thing happens here uh, under, uh, under the uh, usual assumption that, uh, uh, that you're given a ball which is both in the initial and the target domain there exists a harmonic function, phi, in, uh, in, uh, in the ball of radius 1 half, so that uh, this energy distance between the transportation velocity, uh, j divided by rho, is close to the gradient of the harmonic function, and close in the sense that this uh, energy type quantity is estimated by the energy to a power strictly larger than 1. And the, uh, and the Dirichlet energy of this harmonic function is, is controlled uh, in, the, in the way you would expect. So, uh, okay, so first of all, a result of this type shouldn't be really surprising because uh, many of you know that, uh, that the Wasserstein distance, uh, uh, which uh, is kind of the quantity behind uh, uh, the optimum transportation problem, is, in a certain sense, a nonlinear version of the h minus 1 distance. And the h minus 1 distance, uh, yeah, I mean, is related via the potential to the Dirichlet integral. So, uh, 
So in a certain sense, this result here reflects that the Wasserstein distance uh, is close to the H minus 1 distance if the densities are close to 1. But uh, it's, it's the important thing is that this is kind of uh, a quantitative uh, version of this insight. It's a completely quantitative uh, estimate. And again, the important thing is the fact that the exponent here is larger than 1, which means that if locally your transportation distance is small, then you're even closer to, uh, then your, uh, your flux is even closer to flux which comes from a harmonic gradient, right? So that's the, uh, uh, that's the key idea. And there is very, I mean, again, this parallel is minimal surface theory where there's also kind of very explicit uh, estimate of this type. One can, in minimal surface theory, there's also, uh, a more compactness type approach to this, but on the other hand, it, uh, uh, it can also be kind of made explicit, uh, explicit like this. So that's really the key, uh, uh, the key observation. And from then, once you have this lemma, which I want to explain a bit more, then uh, uh, the usual machinery uh, in order to get an epsilon regularity result kicks in. So that's, I guess, on the next slide. So, uh, so once you have this theorem, um, uh, perhaps I can, is there also, hmm. write it down here. So, so again, so the, uh, the statement is that uh, um, uh, you look at the difference between the flux and rho times the gradient of a harmonic function. You look at the usual kinetic energy expression, 0, 1, B1. Uh, this one is estimated up to universal constant, which only depends on dimension, by uh, the uh, transportation distance in the B2 ball to a power strictly larger than 1. So that's the... Uh, uh, That's what I call the lemma. Yeah, I'm sorry, but there's no, uh, there's a. Is that better? Now this <laughs> also. <laughs> Gibt auch seinen Geist auf, uh, as we say in German. That I already used. I think you have to live with this. So, um, uh, so that's the that's kind of the uh, 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 the core di uh, the core problem dependent uh, uh, assumption, and then uh, and then you put it into the machinery to get uh, an epsilon regularity result, uh, which is uh, an iteration. So for that, it's better to go back to the Lagrangian level and to introduce uh, 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 the following modification of the, uh, of the energy where you allow yourself uh, an affine transformation. So uh, E of R would be uh, the properly rescaled energy in a ball uh, uh, around the origin of radius R and now you allow yourself uh, an affine uh, transformation Q and a shift vector B and you don't uh, just look at t minus x, but you look at this type of, uh, this type of uh, transformation. And then the sta you can rephrase using regularity of harmonic functions. You can rephrase this, uh, uh, this lemma in the following way. Uh, if your energy is small on radius r, then uh, for any theta, for any fraction which is very small, the energy on this on a much smaller radius is even smaller uh, provided you kind of change coordinates. You introduce this tilt which is given by the matrix Q and by the shift vector B in the sense that you get the theta square here which comes from uh, kind of using regularity on harmonic functions and you get uh, the super linear term which comes here from, uh, uh, from the right hand side. And you know that you haven't, you didn't need to transform much. So that's the so again, for those who know minimal surface theory, that's exactly the same thing. If you have flatness, 
then the flatness improves if you, if you go to a different set of coordinates. You have to tilt it and then it gets flatter and then you can reapply and it gets even flatter in, an, in, in kind of a, a, an even different uh, a, a set of coordinates and so on. So uh, once, you have this, uh, uh, once you have this here, you can put it into what's called a campanato iteration to get the regularity result. So, but this, in a certain sense, is, is the standard approach to uh, regularity. And it's not, uh, in the end, it's not so much d different from, uh, from the usual thing. Perhaps the only thing which is still specific to, uh, uh, to optimal transportation or the mange ampere equation is that optimal transportation has the affine invariance and not the Euclidean invariance. So, but that's also crucial in Caffarelli's approach that the mange ampere equation is affine invariant. And that plays a role here, that if you even do a non-Euclidean I mean non -Euclidean change of variables, you preserve the structure of the problem. OK? So uh, um, now the, uh, thank you very much. Now the, um, I don't know whether it's still worthwhile. Now the, uh, the extension of this problem, and, and in a certain sense that may show uh, the power of this variational approach over uh, the maximum principle based approach, is that it holds also true if, uh, uh, if you're replacing your initial and your target measure, which here were uh, uh, kind of characteristic functions by general measures. Oops, no, that was okay. And, uh, and even in this situation, when, uh, when, you don't have, uh, uh, when you don't have any regularity of the initial and target measure, so you've just given two measures in RD which have the same mass, uh, and you look at the, uh, as usual, uh, as we did before, as the, uh, at the uh, Eulerian uh, uh, version of optimal transportation, then you still get a result of this type. Uh, uh, and uh, the convenient way to phrase it is to introduce kind of two size measures. Uh, one's the uh, kind of data size measure, so that measures, uh, D measures how close in the right topology, in the Wasserstein topology, in the square of the Wasserstein distance, uh, the initial and the target measure are close to the Lebesgue measure, and E is our, as before, our local energy. And, uh, and still, uh, you have a uh, now I've written it in a less quantitative way. Uh, you have the same type of result uh, that for any uh, 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 small number tau, there exists a threshold such that provided uh, your uh, D and E is below that threshold, there exists a harmonic gradient so that optimal transportation is close uh, to the harmonic gradient uh, with an estimate which is, uh, which is tau, which is this tiny number times E, plus the data term. And that's again very much like in elliptic regularity theory that uh, you can show that the, in the energy norm uh, your solution is closer to a simpler problem, in this case uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Poisson equation, um, uh, with uh, something which only depends a little bit on what's outside and depends quite a bit on the local right-hand side, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's this, uh, the fact that you only need a little bit of this energy here, which allows you to kind of localize, in a certain sense, to show that everything that's happening far away doesn't really matter, and that's the, uh, uh, that's the main ingredient for regularity theory. So, uh, uh, so that's exactly the type of result we need for the matching problem, because in this case, the measures are, uh, one of the measures is a Dirac measure, so highly irregular. Okay, how much time do I still have? Okay, so, uh, so now what I want to do is I want to first give you uh, a little bit uh, uh, an ingredient, uh, what's behind this type of result, this uh, approximation by harmonic gradients, and, uh, and then I want to tell you a bit, uh, oops, uh, What's, uh, uh, what needs to be changed if you want to consider a kind of more general or completely general uh, initial and target measures. And then I want to go to the matching problem. So that's the plan. Uh, yeah. So, 
No, 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 no. But but uh, uh, so uh, but that's already the case uh, in the almost uh, in the partial regularity result of uh, Figali and Kim. That of course the interesting case is when the target domain is non-convex, because otherwise you could immediately uh, uh, appeal to Caffarelli and say everything is fine. So they want to have a, they want to say that even if the target domain is non-convex. Uh, in a certain sense, you can say something about regularity, which is partial regularity, and it's built on this epsilon regularity result. And so, uh, so it's a completely local approach. Uh, you don't you don't care for how things look uh, look uh, look at the boundary or far away. Does that answer the question? Okay. Okay. So uh, uh, so uh, so the ingredients. Uh, the ingredients for the lemma are um, are the following. So here again is uh, uh, I, I, I recall you the main part of the lemma, this uh, kind of super linear uh, uh, estimate of the uh, energy difference between optimal transportation and the uh, 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 and the Poisson equation, super linear in the sense that this exponent is larger than one. So how do you uh, how do you get this? Well, I mean, first of all, you have to construct it. So it's, as I said, a completely constructive proof. So you have to construct this harmonic function. So how to construct this harmonic function? Uh, well, uh, 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 by giving, by, uh, require, uh, by requiring, ba by imposing boundary data. And what are the most natural boundary data to impose? The most, I mean, it's more natural since it's about transportation, it's more natural to think about fluxes, so Neumann boundary conditions, instead of Dirichlet boundary conditions. So you should impose Neumann, or it's natural to impose Neumann boundary conditions. And, uh, and what Neumann boundary conditions should you impose? Well, in a certain sense, you want to, since you want to compare uh, gradient of phi to j, uh, you should, I mean, it's natural to take the same boundary conditions for j and gradient of phi. But now you run into a slight technical difficulty in the sense that the uh, j, this flux, uh, is a function of time and space, whereas uh, the PDE, uh, uh, this boundary value problem, of course, just sees space. So the na most natural choice is to say, well, let's take the time average uh, of, uh, so uh, here we, uh, we have somewhere the boundary, dbr, and uh, and we take the time average of um, we take the time average uh, uh, of the flux boundary data of J as our flux boundary data for the uh, for the harmonic function, and then as it's you know so many of you will know it's good to kind of uh, choose a good slice. I mean we have some freedom of where since it's an interior regularity result, we have some freedom of where we put the radius and we choose the radius in a smart way and we choose the radius in such a way that the, uh, uh, that the transport restricted to this uh, uh, sphere is of the same order as the transport on the ball. So that can always be done. So, so this is how you get the, uh, um, the harmonic function. And, uh, and then essentially, uh, relies on two observations. One is uh, kind of an orthogonality, uh, uh, which is uh, very much like in linear variation or quadratic variation problems, that the, uh, uh, that the distance, the energy distance to the minimum is estimated by the energy gap. So how well can you approximate, uh, uh, I mean, that's the quantity we're interested in. And that, in the end, is estimated by the difference between the actual nonlinear transportation distance and the Dirichlet integral. So that's what I, if we, w if we had a completely quadratic problem, this would be an identity. But luckily, since, and there, this is a huge simplification, uh, uh, because uh, then we know that this rho by McCann's displacement convexity is always less or equal to one. And using this uh, clear inequality, we get this clear inequality. So that's something we need to substitute when we look at more general measures. So that's the orthogonality. That's a simple integration by parts. And, uh, and then the key part is to construct a competitor, right? I mean, in, in the approach uh, to regularity theory in variational problems is always by constructing something that could potentially be smarter and then you know, using the fact that it could, can't be smarter. So, uh, 
uh, so that's the, that's the key step. We, we're constructing a competitor, uh, a row tilde, J tilde, which has the same boundary conditions as row J, uh, and where uh, the, uh, uh, the transportation energy minus the Dirichlet energy is of higher order in the sense that it's estimated by this uh, superlinear expression of the flux. So those are the three, uh, those are the three steps of the, uh, of the regularity theory. And, uh, and the main, uh, uh, kind of the main step is, uh, is how to get this competitor. And there one needs a boundary layer construction because uh, the, main, the main issue is really uh, how to go from uh, the flux boundary conditions F, which is the normal component of J, to its time average. And uh, so that's the, uh, that's the difficulty which arises there. And uh, in order to accommodate, in order to go uh, from F to F bar, or in order to accommodate for the difference between F and F bar, you need a boundary layer construction. And that, in the end, reduces to trace estimate. And this is a little bit reminiscent of an argument uh, uh, Giovanni Alberti was from Choxi and I used in, uh, in kind of a different problem of calculus variations. And here we're using kind of the same uh, uh, the same tool. Okay, so that's the um, uh, that's uh, that's how to uh, how to get it in the uh, in case of the uh, in case of the lemma. And now in uh, uh, in case of this uh, proposition, where we're more ambitious, and now we have kind of two general measures, mu zero and mu one, and we claim something. Uh, uh, very similar. Is estimated by tau times E plus a constant which depends on tau times D. And E being the energy, D being the data term. Um, we run into, uh, into some, uh, some interesting questions. So here, uh, here's the definition again of the data term and the energy. Uh, and the, uh, the first difficulty is that uh, in this case, uh, rho and j are really just measures. Before, we knew that uh, because of McCann that rho is an L uh, j is an L2 function and rho is bounded by 1. So now we're kind of in the very general context of, uh, of uh, optimal transportation where these objects are just measures and not L2 functions. But then it's a little bit difficult for, in terms of the... Uh, boundary values of our elliptic operator. We cannot just take, uh, or it, we, we lack the estimates to, uh, to do something uh, if, it's, uh, if it's a measure. And there uh, we need kind of to approximate F bar, which is a measure by an L2 function. But again, optimal transportation itself gives us a good way of doing that. There is kind of an intrinsic nonlinear way of doing such an approximation. Uh, uh, so, uh, which in a certain sense is explained by this picture by coupling uh, uh, the transportation from the uh, initial measure to the constant and from the initial measure to the target measure by looking at all the trajectories that leave the domain. That's in a certain sense which gives, which gives rise to F and connecting them to some density on the bottom and projecting that density on the boundary. That's, uh, that's what the G is, and for this G you get, uh, provided you choose the right radius, you get a nonlinear approximation argument in the sense that, uh, 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 that the L2 norm of this G is controlled, and the distance of G to the F, which you really want, is superlinear. So, uh, so, uh, so and I, I think in, uh, uh, in the interest of time, I'm looking again at the chair to tell, 15 or 15? 15. Yeah, it, it was kind of clear that it wouldn't be 50 <laughs> minutes again. <laughs> and uh, uh, okay, so uh, um, so uh, so there 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 are a couple of int I mean, from the point of view of optimal transportation, there are a couple of interesting uh, challenges in the general case, which uh, in a in a certain sense can be nicely done intrinsically. You need an L infinity estimate. That's actually the only place where you ever use. Uh, something on the some structural property on the uh, optimal uh, uh, on the on the solution, like in this case monotonicity. Uh, you need to introduce boundary layers, 
next to uh, sorry initial and ter initial and terminal layers next to boundary layers uh, but then it again reduces essentially to the same two ingredients we had before uh, a construction and an orthogonality observation where now the orthogonality observation becomes more subtle so instead of this being less or equal to zero thanks to McCann one has to estimate it but uh, but this can be done okay so uh, uh, so uh, uh, so we, uh, so uh, um, Martin Husmann and uh, Michael Goldman and I did this kind of generalization because we were uh, looking at this uh, problem of matching uh, or I mean to be honest perhaps it was also a bit the other way around we thought we had this nice regularity theory and now we were looking out for a good application and, uh, um, and this matching problem uh, uh, kind of came, uh, came quite naturally to our mind uh, so I recall, you've, uh, I recall to you the, uh, the matching problem, so, uh, uh, so you give yourself uh, a kind of a large torus where L is the linear size of the torus, uh, you uh, throw uh, randomly uh, uh, the right number of points uh, uh, into the torus, into, into the torus uh, uniformly distributed uh, and the number of points is such <coughs> that the typical distance between the points is of order 1 so for the experts, that's kind of a poor man's version of the Poisson point process. In the Poisson point process, you would also make the number of points random, but concentrated around that number. And then, uh, and then you look at the uh, uh, then you look at this uh, uh, at this uh, 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 sum of Dirac measure. So this type of uh, empirical measure, if you want, and you're interested in uh, looking at the optimal transportation problem uh, from uh, the Lebesgue measure, which, uh, because you looked at this uh, microcanonical ensemble, has exactly the same mass as the uh, uh, Poisson measure. You look at the optimal transportation of Lebesgue into Poisson, and you're interested in the hydrodynamic limit. So you're interested in large, uh, in large domains. So, uh, uh, so here again is is the setting, uh, uh, the setting of uh, of the problem, and uh, so this is, uh, I think. Uh, uh, um, a problem which uh, you know computer scientists have looked at, but then, uh, uh, as I wa was told by uh, uh, by Luigi, also kind of physicists here in Pisa got interested uh, in into this problem, and in particular Parisi, who I think is quite a quite famous theoretical physicist, uh, got interested in this problem, and they uh, uh, they kind of had this uh, this vision that uh, which in a certain sense is a little bit in line with this type of result. Uh, that uh, uh, oh now I'm gone that's good um, <laughs> that uh, the um, uh, that the in fact the optimal transportation map should be close to the identity plus something that solves a Poisson problem and uh, since uh, uh, since the target measure in a certain sense can be roughly assimilated to the uniform measure perturbed by something which on large scales behaves like white noise, uh, the right hand side of the Poisson equation should be white noise. And that of course is something which you can characterize completely, you can relate to, uh, uh, you can relate to, uh, uh, so the gradient in a certain sense is a little bit like the, uh, uh, like the Gaussian free uh, field. So this is an object which now you understand very well and therefore, uh, they said, well, this transportation distance to leading order should be approximated by the Dirichlet integral uh, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the solution of this stochastic partial differential, linear stochastic partial differential equation. And then you see a phase transition at two dimensions, very much like you're used to from the Gaussian free field. Namely, uh, if, you're in, uh, if you're in high dimensions, at least on large scales, uh, uh, you have uh, you, ha you don't have an ultra an infrared divergence, but on uh, in dimension two it's borderline. You have an infrared divergence, and uh, it grows logarithmically in the size of the system. So in a certain sense, the two-dimensional case for this problem is the most interesting, and uh, and that is also borne out by by result of uh, Martin Husmann and Theo Sturm, who showed that uh, if you were right away looking. Um, at the infinite uh, volume limit, and you were asking the question, is there a stationary shift covariant 
optimal transportation. So in a certain sense, like uh, uh, the stationary corrector or the gradient of stationary gradient of a corrector in stochastic homogenization, uh, they made the point that this can only be if, dimension, if the dimension is strictly larger than 2. So only if you don't have this, uh, uh, this, uh, ultra, uh, this infrared <laughs> divergence, you can hope for having, uh, uh, for having kind of a simple functional analytic approach uh, to, this, to this problem. And on the other hand, uh, 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 kind of uh, Luigi Ambrosi and uh, many of his co-workers and new ones uh, kind of looked at the two-dimensional case from... Uh, 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 from the point of view of uh, uh, energetics and uh, 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 in this uh, result got a v uh, kind of confirmed the heuristically predicted uh, energy scaling uh, and logarithmic divergence of the uh, optimal transportation cost. And, uh, and now in the recent work uh, with Federico Claudi, uh, Claudio also uh, kind of uh, on that macroscopic scale closeness of the optimal map to uh, the Poisson problem. Now, uh, now what we hope, or what we in a certain sense did, is uh, a similar type of result, but on the local scale. So in a certain sense of kind of uh, looking at the homogenization limit, we want to look at the fluctuations. We really want to look at how on the scale of, on the, scale of the distance between the points, what can we say? So kind of in a certain sense looking looking at the same type of question but from a finer uh, perspective and um, and essentially uh, so one of uh, one of the main results so in fact this is already posted uh, one of the main results is that uh, uh, if you look at uh, if you look at this uh, matching problem and you let the you look at larger and larger um, uh, uh, sample sizes but then you zoom in locally you let's say around the origin and you look at a radius uh, that's essentially large but order that's uh, might be large but of order one so not I mean local not global then uh, you can show that uh, this globally defined uh, optimal transportation map is close to a shift in the uh, local L2 sense uh, uh, and the shift itself uh, uh, grows uh, logarithmically in the system size L and uh, while we are not yet in the position, but I hope we'll be eventually, to get the right power of the logarithm, which, uh, 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 which should be uh, logarithm L to the power one half, uh, we get this, uh, we get as an upper bound for the shift, we get this logarithmic behavior. And then equipped with this behavior, in a certain sense, we can give in a, in a, certain, weak, in a certain weak sense the result that indeed, also in the two-dimensional case, there exists a limiting object, but the limiting object, it's not the map T that's shift invariant or stationary, but it's the gradient of the map T that's shift invariant. And those who know uh, 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 stochastic homogenization, it's a little bit like uh, uh, for the corrector in random stochastic homogenization in two dimensions, the corrector itself is not a stationary object, but the gradient of the corrector is a stationary object. And here, it's the gradient of the uh, transport map that's, uh, that's a stationary object. And uh, uh, um, so that's, uh, that's uh, for this result, we exactly need the, uh, uh, this extension, uh, 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 this proposition, which, uh, uh, which I stated earlier, which, uh, which extends the lemma uh, to a general target measure. So in this case, we just needed the target measure to be general, not the initial measure, but uh, uh, we can go the full way and consider both, uh, uh, um, uh, both as general. So, uh, so that's, uh, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the application which we want to pursue uh, of uh, this type of uh, variational regularity theory for mont jean to, uh, 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 to the matching problem which I wanted to point out at the end. And I think that my time also should be over. So, uh, so the first part uh, was kind of a more classical situation where we reproved uh, by variational methods the known results by uh, Figali Kim, Figali uh, de Filippis. And, uh, and the second part is, is, is an application to, uh, to this matching problem where uh, we hope eventually to be able to say uh, uh, more things. Okay, so that's... Uh,